Okay, so are we recording? We are recording. So this is a kind of weird section. It's it's two topics basically unrelated to one another and jammed together. Um, fortunately, neither of the topics, I think, is going to be very time consuming. Let's state topic one which is fundamental matrices. So this topic isn't very time consuming because it sort of asks a question and then answers it in the negative. we can solve equations that look like this. In theory, we can always solve equations that look like this. Um, we find the eigenvalues of A, we find the eigenvectors, maybe we find generalized eigenvectors, Maybe some of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are complex, but we can put them all together and get a general solution. And the, the sort of the question I said that we're going to pose is, is it let, let me try to find a less value-laden uh, way of phrasing this. I, I guess I'll just phrase it. In a purely neutral, can we solve x prime? equals a times x, where instead of a vector x, we have an entire matrix of functions. The derivative of a matrix equals another matrix times the original matrix. And when I phrase it like this, the answer is now affirmative. But we don't really ha get anything new from this. The answer is yes. The solution is traditionally written as phi, maybe phi, I'm never quite sure. So I've mentioned this, that a lot of times when we have matrices, we're basically thinking of them as vector storage units. The solution to this matrix equation is the matrix whose columns are the solutions to x prime equals ax, where a is now, um, sorry, where x is now a vector. And this phi, is called the fundamental matrix, which at least for our purposes, 
feels like it's overselling it a little. I mean, if you compare it to something like the fundamental theorem of calculus, we won't be doing a lot with these allegedly fundamental matrices. But to sort of summarize as a, as a list, to solve a differential equation like this, I guess that's introductory material and not part of the list. To solve something like this, we solve x prime equals ax. And when I solve it, I mean, we want to find all of the solutions. If, if A were an N by N matrix, then we want N solutions to lowercase x prime equals A times lowercase x. And then instead of creating the general solution, We put them into a matrix. I'm writing X one, X two, up until X n, and then we're done. This is. The solution, the solution is X not nice. This is the solution. V prime equals A times phi. So if we can solve vector differential equations, we can solve matrix differential equations. We're not getting a huge amount of new stuff from this idea. One thing we do get though, These matrix differential equations can be helpful if you will want to consider multiple initial conditions. So we haven't done a lot with initial conditions lately. But ordinarily, if you have a vector equation like this, x prime equals ax, you're going to have an initial condition. Remember that in general, differential equations have infinite solutions. 
But then if you have an initial condition, those all collapse down into a single solution. Um, so there are situations in engineering, for example, where we're going to have that matrix fixed, but we're going to want to consider a lot of different initial conditions. So we want to be able to easily change this x sub zero. And one nice thing about using fundamental matrices is that we'll end up with a solution where the vector of initial conditions shows up. And let's, um, let's try to clarify that. So let's say we have X prime equals AX, and we have some initial condition. Then putting aside the initial condition for just a moment, um, when we solve this, we find that X is a linear combination of solutions. That is to say, we find the general solution. And we can rewrite this. This might not really be second nature to us if we haven't taken a linear algebra class, but we can rewrite this as a matrix times a vector. And this matrix ought to look familiar. This matrix is the fundamental matrix. And let me just remind you, because it's going to come up soon, that the fundamental matrix is a matrix of functions. It's got those e to the lambda t's in it. It's got the combinations of the sine and the cosine in it. If there are negative, if there are complex eigenvalues. So this is the fundamental matrix. And then that vector we'll call the C vector because all of the C's are stored in it. And let's now play with this fact. X of zero equals phi of zero times C. Good so far. Now one of our, because we don't have um, a linear algebra prerequisite, and because I keep 
bringing that up, I mean, I might as well say the reason we don't is because we want students to take this soon after calculus. It's not like there isn't a reason for it. But because there isn't a linear algebra prerequisite, we are going to do the world's fastest lecture on inverse trig functions. No, we're not. I, I don't know why sometimes I'm talking and words just come out of my mouth and they're not even close to what I'm trying to say. The world's fastest lecture on matrix inverses. So when we have numbers, we can divide. So if, we're, if we have like an equality like that, we could divide both sides by V. If we had like X equals K times C, we could divide by K. We don't think of us as dividing matrices, although we basically can. Another way of thinking of this is that instead of dividing by K, we can multiply by one over K. And this one over K is K to the negative first. So we could do this. We could go from X equals KC to K inverse X the multiplicative inverse of k times x equals c. So with matrices, again, the, the convention is to say that we don't divide matrices, but we essentially do. It's just that instead of using the division notation, we use this inverse notation. We divide both sides by A, except that we think of it as multiplying both sides by one over A, essentially. Um, and matrices, matrices, matrix inverses are kind of a deep concept. Um, not every matrix has an inverse, and there are numerical issues with finding inverses. Um, just like we don't go over Gauss-Jordan elimination in this class, just like we think of RREF as being a black box algorithm. We are not going to talk about how to find inverses in this class. Um, say you have a matrix and you need to know its inverse. When we go into the matrix menu, we hit A, 
And then this button right here, this x to the negative first button, will find the inverse of a. It sadly often happens that inverses are quite ugly decimals. We could turn this into fractions if we preferred. And I know I'm moving through this very quickly, but that's because we're going to use inverses, I think, literally once in this class. It simply doesn't make sense to dwell on them. And that once is right now. This matrix, phi of zero inverse times x of zero equals c. And I mean, if you have seen inverses before, I will, and, and you're sort of aware of some of the issues that arise, I'll just say that phi of zero definitely has an inverse because um, phi of zero comes from that matrix and the columns of that matrix are linearly independent because the columns of this matrix are linearly independent solutions. So if that doesn't make any sense to you, never mind. I'm just saying that this phi of zero inverse exists and we can solve for C. And once we've solved for C, well, X is phi of T times C. And C is phi of zero inverse times our vector of initial conditions, X sub zero. And again, the reason you might want to think of it this way, notice that um, the very first thing we did on this frame was say, okay, we can solve this. We can go from here to here. Everything else on this frame seems like extra work. But again, the reason we're doing this, it's not just extra work for the heck of it. The vector of initial conditions is right there. So going back to something I said, when you're doing like stability analysis in engineering, you might have a differential equation and you might want to solve it and you might want to look at the solution when you have 20,000 different initial conditions. Well, in a situation like that, it's very convenient to have your solution in this form because you can just tell the computer you're working on Okay, here's the list of initial conditions. Here's an X 
Excel document of the initial conditions that I want you to investigate, read off the Excel document, plug them in one by one, and see what happens. So it's convenient in certain settings. Um, any questions about that? If not, then I, I said this section is kind of two topics that, that don't seem very related to me. Topic two. is matrix exponentiation. And I'm going to tag this topic as theoretical. In the theory, this gives us another way of looking at solutions in practice, it's a much less convenient way than what we already have. So if we're not working with matrices, if X is just a variable and A is just a number and we have X prime equals AX, then the solution to this is x equals c times e to the a t. Um, we have solved this as a um, as an exercise in separation of variables. So this topic is going to ask, well, what if X is a vector and A is a matrix? Can we do the same thing? Can we write that X equals a constant times E to the a t. And the answer is yes, um, with some difficulty. And the difficulty here is that we haven't defined how to exponentiate a matrix. That is, we know We know how to find e to a number. So there's no problem here. But down here, we have e raised to a matrix. And we haven't defined what it means to take E and raise it to a matrix. And now we will. And in one sense, it's a super um, straightforward is the wrong way. No, I'm probably lying. There's probably not any sense where you'd call what I'm going to do straightforward. Um, we did hopefully all take calculus. I mean, I know we did because it's a prereq for this course. And in calculus, we see tails are series and infinite sums. And we see that e to the x is one plus x plus x squared over two factorial 
plus x cubed over three factorial plus, and this sum goes on forever. So just as a quick graphical reminder, because I know we saw this in calc to this, but maybe, maybe we don't remember it so well. So here's e to the x. Here's one plus x. I mean, already, if you zoomed in, and just looked at e to the x and 1 plus x around here, already these two curves are very similar looking. I mean, of course, when we zoom out, they don't look alike. But in this area here, they're similar looking. And if we add an x squared over 2 factorial, again, I mean, eventually, this curve here and this curve here don't look anything alike. But in sort of this region of the graph, these look a lot alike. And as we keep adding these terms, we're getting, I don't know why, desmosis usually quick. We're getting some input delay. But you see the more of these terms we add, the more alike this exponential and this polynomial become. I mean, we can certainly see us in the negative region. Of course, these differences are fairly obvious. But over here, I mean, this function, these two functions just look identical up to visual inspection. So, I mean, here we have six terms. If we could imagine, probably, probably Desmos is not going to, no, that was a pipe dream. If Desmos could just recognize this pattern for us, it cannot. But I mean, we saw what happened up to six terms. If we now imagine a million terms or a billion terms, and if we allow an infinite number of terms, the graphs would be totally identical. Um, again, thinking back to counter this, the technical way of framing this is that this is the Taylor series or the McLaurin series of the exponential. And the McLaurin series converges everywhere and it converges specifically to the exponential function. And now we have to remember Of course, if we're adding matrices together, we can't be adding numbers like one. But there's a matrix that acts like one. 
we've seen this already when we talked about eigenvalues. So one of matrices is the identity matrix. It has ones down the diagonal and is zero everywhere else. And we can square and cube and raise to powers any square matrix. So we can define E to a matrix as the one of matrices, the identity matrix. Thus, say we can divide by numbers, that's scalar multiplication. And if we define matrix exponentiation in this way, then That is satisfied. Um, this pattern carries through, and we can think of the solution um, of a vector differential equation in terms of exponentials. Now, I've, I've referred to this as theoretical. Um, we already know how to solve x prime equals ax. We do it with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, maybe generalized eigenvectors in the absolute worst case. Um, there is basically no situation or there are very few situations where instead of working with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you would decide that what you really want to do is start messing around with infinite sequences. I mean, an infinite sequence is infinite. It is not easy to work with. So in practice, when we need to solve um, these matrix equations, um, we'll do so using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We won't be solving them using this stuff that I've circled down here. I mean, having said that, if, I mean, probably for most students are doing this um, for like math, pure math or math education, maybe most people are planning to go to grad school, but like in a graduate level differential equations course, it's extremely likely that this is how you'll see um, this material discussed. So it's not like it's something that the textbook author made up just to make everyone's life harder. It does get used in sort of more advanced classes, but it probably won't get used much in Math 330. So it's early, but with the test Thursday, there was never any thought that I was going to start a new section.